Hello, it's Julesy, and I am supremely excited to be launching this series, Focus on the State. 2020 has already proven itself to be an exhaustive year. The built up frustrations that have peaked around the police brutality against the black community are not at all comforted or assaged with the idea that in November of 2020, we will be voting between two old white men. And it is very kind of me to leave it at that. But yes, we know 2020 is an election year and more than just the presidency is at stake. I absolutely understand being wary of the presidential election and every four years suddenly hearing about the things this one person can potentially change. And for many of us, we don't really see the crucial benefits promised to us because the politics that impact us the most are our state and local politics. And so in this series, Focus on the States walks you through the pertinence of what's happening on the state, county, and local level. And that will address many of our concerns that have become national boiling points in the past week. In this interview, I sit down with Josie Duffy Rice, whose work with the Justice Collaborative and the Appeal publication has focused on prosecutorial accountability and criminal justice. We connect the web of voter suppression to the Ahmaud Aubrey case. We discuss the systematic changes that would need to happen to make defunding the police a successful call to action. And overall, Josie drops so much important information on the tentacles of state politics and the criminal justice system. It's a long interview, but worth every minute of it. Stay with us and thank you to all my supporters on Patreon who have made this series possible. Hey guys, so today with Focus on the State, I am interviewing Josie Duffy Rice. I'm just gonna get right into the questions and go ahead and start. So I would love to talk to you about your organization, The Appeal, um, well, the publication. And would you be kind enough to explain to us what kind of journalism and projects The Appeal is producing? Sure, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, the Appeal is a outlet that produces original journalism about the criminal justice system primarily, and we've existed for about two years. Um, we've traditionally covered like mostly prosecutors, police, prisons, all of the criminal justice system, the things that really make it make it as big as it is, you know, that really cause mass incarceration. And traditionally, that's what we've covered, criminal justice. We've actually recently started expanding a little bit because of the coronavirus. So we're covering more issues now, mainly about how coronavirus is impacting people who are what we consider to be vulnerable. So that's not just people in the criminal justice system, right? That's people who may be homeless or need affordable housing or are living paycheck to paycheck or um, you know, are, are faced with eviction, are faced with healthcare issues, just all the various things that are coming up in the coronavirus and are exacerbated in the coronavirus times, we're really focused on that. So that's what we do. And that includes articles, but we also have two podcasts. Um, we produced a short documentary last year, and the second part recently came out. So we're really trying to get our hands into like every different medium. And then the last thing is we have a daily show called The Briefing, which we produce with Now This, which where we interview um, elected officials, both on the federal level and on the local level about issues having to do with policing, housing, mental health, um, health care, all sorts of issues that um, affect vulnerable people in America right now. Yeah. So your name, well, your, I know your focus on your work for the past couple of years has been criminal justice, but your your work comes up across the spectrum. Right. Anytime I'm looking up things yeah. to deal with the black community and like what are the politics and how are these court cases happening, trying to change public policy around it. You know, you, you your work has consistently come up in the mix, which is why I was really excited to have this opportunity to sit down with you. So one of the places which is criminal justice, but one of the places in which your work comes up, not necessarily in the frame that my audience might be thinking is the Ahmaud Arbery case. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a passage in Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy where he discusses the different types of lawyers who handle the criminal case versus the lawyers who handle the civil case and mm -hmm. how the disparate interest of civil cases versus a criminal case can undermine the criminal case. Yeah. Um, 
And so, you know, especially currently, right, in this age of social media with Black Lives Matter and the certain, certain people have more visibility than others, you're kind of wondering, okay, well, they're representing the family, but the court case goes differently and we tend mm -hmm. to, we might conflate that. You know, select players have had made their lane as civil suit lawyers to the families of uh, wrongfully killed Black people. And those are often the representatives who we see speak on television. A lot of my audience, I think, is likely getting their information from civil suit lawyers. And so I don't necessarily have an exact, exact question for this, but do you have any thoughts on the celebrity of civil suit lawyers, how that information might be different from the information that a criminal lawyer would be handing out to the public? Yeah. And yeah, I is that I'm even sorry. the right terminology to be using for them? So, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's good. I mean, yeah, I mean, and I think it's actually a really great question. I've never really been asked this. And so I just want to say I appreciate the question because I think, um, it's really interesting. And I'll give a little bit of background. So when we talk about something like what happened to Ahmaud Arbery, where someone is, you know, murdered, murdered is a legal term, they haven't been convicted yet, but definitely killed by two people. They, obviously, there's a criminal case, which is, is this person going to go to, are these people going to go to prison? Are they going to, you know, be convicted of a crime? But then there's this other part, which is you could sue them in civil court also to receive a settlement. Um, I think the probably the most famous example of the difference between civil and criminal cases would be the OJ case because he didn't get convicted in criminal court, but he did have to pay a civil settlement. It's harder to get convicted in criminal court than it is to be found liable in civil court. So it's look, don't go to law school. Don't <laughs> don't don't spend all your years knowing oh, no. that. I'm going to go too deep into this, but I'm just, that, that's the basic difference. So to your point, like it is absolutely true. You see it left and right that people when, especially when black and armed people are killed by the police, often there's a settlement on the back end and it's coming through either the city, very, very rarely it's coming from the police officer, et cetera. But that's happening with a civil lawyer. And there are some really famous sort of celebrity civil lawyers who sh you see every time something happens, right? Who are representing Maude Arbery's family, they're representing George Floyd's family. I think that there's a lot of different space in criminal justice and criminal justice reform to make change and to have influence. And so I appreciate people coming at this issue from all different sides. And look, we need someone to hold these these officers and the system accountable in civil court too, right? Like money talks, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, I, I think it's great when families who have watched their loved ones be killed by the state on camera are, are given millions of dollars. I think that's great. I think it's a different question than systemic change because we can keep doing that forever, right? Cops can keep killing people. Taxpayers can keep paying that those settlements out. People can keep dying and nothing will change. And so the reality of all the different roles that people play in the system from criminal defense lawyer to civil defense lawyer to policy to journalism, like there's just so much happening um, to organizing, right? That And it all needs to happen, but I wouldn't say it all serves the same purpose. And so for me, like that wouldn't be like how I chose to come at this space, but I think it's really important that, that some people are. Um, I just wouldn't consider that them very crucial parts of the larger conversation around criminal justice reform, because that's just not the role we're trying to play, which yeah. is fine. Yeah, because, you know, I remember reading in Just Mercy, when I read the book, I was like Brian Stevenson, and I forget the man, and I saw the movie, so why don't I remember the man's name? It's like Walter something um, that he was representing. Uh huh. I'm right. I'm not gonna remember right now either, but I know <laughs> I know I know who you're talking about. It's the it's the kind of main character in the story who ends up getting exonerated. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And Stevenson is talking about you know he was part of representing the def well in this case you're representing a defendant, right? Who's wrongly accused, and the civil suit lawyers kind of wanted to expose more information, but that actually harms the potential mm -hmm. for them to get the you know, the, what is it, the ruling that they want out of the court case. Right, right. And so that's I mean, kind of what I think of when my audience is upset that I might not be putting out the same information, well, not even just me, but that I might not repost or that I'm kind of quiet or that they see certain information coming from these civil suit lawyers and feeling like that's what we should be talking about. And it's not necessarily going that way with the case. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting point because it is very common that like, especially I think probably in wrongful conviction cases that what's happening in civil court trying to protect 
someone's interest in civil court is just very different than trying to protect them in criminal court. And the appeals process is different. The standard, um, the standard for conviction is different. You know, like in criminal court, you have to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt. When you get into civil court, it's just more about probability, right? And so it's complicated and it really depends on what a family's goals are and what our goals are, I think, and it sort of depends family to family. I mean, there are probably families, especially who have really, really um, suffered under police violence and maybe lost a family member to a to a police officer or something that maybe it's more important for them to get a civil court conviction and get a settlement than it is for them to get a criminal court conviction. And maybe they think that's more likely to happen. I, you know, like it varies. A lot case of variables, to- yeah. Yeah, but it's definitely true that like sometimes those two goals just can't both really be met given the other goal. And I think it's really interesting that Brian Stevenson talks about that because I don't know that most people think about these as different things. One is the settlement, the civil process. One is the criminal conviction. They're very different. So I'm going to move along and I'm going to kind of what might seem to my audience make a leap, but it's definitely connected to the uh, Maud Arbery case. So in 2018, you wrote a piece for the New York Times entitled How to Punish Voters, which details how Waycross Judicial Circuit District Attorney George Barnhill, I have braces, that was a lot, (laughs) pressed felony charges against Olivia Pearson, an elder black woman in coffee country, Georgia, for improperly assisting a voter. So can you explain the particulars of this case and how it relates to voter suppression and then why this is adjacent to the Ahmaud Arbery case? Absolutely. So, yeah, so I got um, information about this case from a friend a couple of years ago who said there's a woman in South Georgia who's being prosecuted for voter fraud. And it's it's an outrageous story. And what happened was Olivia Pearson was a woman in her 60s, no criminal record, local city councilwoman. And in 2012, she was at a polling site and a 21 year old woman came in and said, this is my first time voting. How do I use the voter machine? Now I live in Georgia. I don't know what the voting machines are in y'all states, but you get a little card, you put it in. It's like, you have to, whatever there it's, it's, it's not, it's not complicated. It's not like you just, it's not intuitive. Yeah. You've never done it before. You've never, it's not going to make sense. Look, and if you take time out of your day to go vote, right, this is a young woman. Like she wants to make sure she's doing it right. So she asked, how do I do this? Olivia Pearson said, oh, you go to the machine, you put the card in and you make your selections and you're done. That was the extent of their conversation. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but Olivia Pearson never touched her machine, never didn't watch her vote, didn't tell her who to vote for. I mean, there was no even allegation that she did that. Right. Years later, four years later, Olivia Pearson finds out that she's being prosecuted for voter fraud and they charge her with felonies that if she had been convicted would have resulted in 15 years in prison. And it, it, I mean, to me, it was just a mind blowing case because it's the ultimate example of how we punish people for, and black people in particular, black people, um, people, you know, le- like people on the left, Democrats, like that's really where this for, you know, this illusion of voter fraud. Well, that's what they're called. That's an example of what they call voter fraud, right? That this woman was told that this is how you use the machine and that's it. And if you read the transcript, so Olivia Pearson ended up going to trial twice. Um, they tried her twice for this, which is an outrage. The first time there was a hung jury, meaning the jury couldn't decide, you know, couldn't make a decision. And so they tried her again. And that time she was quickly acquitted. But if you read the trial transcript, it's not like they were alleging she was trying to fix an election. She was trying to cheat. They they just said that she couldn't tell the woman how the voter machine worked. The reason this is particularly important when we think about Ahmaud Arbery and the reason it makes the Ahmaud Arbery case even wilder is because the two men who killed Amanda Arbery, the McMichaels, one of them used to work for um, George Barnhill, who was the DA who tried Olivia Pearson, right? And that's one of the DAs who declined to bring any charges against these two men. So what you see in a place like South Georgia is that a prosecutor, everywhere you go, prosecutors have a lot of power, but there you can really see how it shapes 
the way they deal with black people. Because on one hand, they're willing to spend the money, the time, the resources to prosecute an, an elder black woman for voter fraud, to take her to trial twice, but they're not willing, right, to try two white men for shooting a black man in the street, in public for no reason. Um, we've all, we all know what happened there. We have all seen the video. And it's just another example of prosecutors wielding a lot of power and using that power against black people. So it's both that they over prosecute black people, but it's also that when they don't want to prosecute people who harm black people, they just choose not to. And they can't, you know, like that's, I mean, I would argue that's deeply, deeply, deeply unethical. And I guess he could be, he could face like, you know, a censure from the bar or he could not win the next reelection, but he didn't do, the prosecutor didn't do anything illegal. They're allowed to do that. Um, and it's, it's deeply disturbing when you compare the case of Olivia Pearson to the case of the McMichaels. I mean, and I've read all this and it's still like shocking to shocking. hear. Like I'm informed, but it's still, even when you say it, it's just like, it's such know, a grotesque use of the law. Um, and I have to say my brother, I mean, my brother lives in those counties. Like he lives, um, he lives in South Georgia. He lives in Ware County, which is where Ahmaud Arbery was killed. And when you think about how scary it is to have, my brother's a, a black guy who runs. I have to constantly think, well, if something happened to him, I don't know that I would ever have access to know what happened because you can't trust that system, right? They have not proven themselves to be trustworthy. In particular to prosecutors, you know, you wrote a piece in 2017 about the myth of progressive prosecutors. So while the article focuses on Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance, you ended the piece with over a thousand prosecutors will be up for election next year in places like Dallas, San Diego, Seattle, Oakland, California, and Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where I live. Voters... Yay. <laughs> voters ought to make sure the people who win these crucial races are actual criminal justice reformers, not just people who they say they are. So even within South Georgia, right, these are still elected officials. Mm -hmm. So how can voters and everyday people ensure that their politicians who are up for election in their district are actual criminal justice reformers? Yeah, it's a hard question, right? And the reason it's a hard question is is for a couple of reasons. The first is that the criminal justice system is really opaque. So someone can tell you they're doing all the right things, and maybe they do all the right things in some cases, but to really know what they're doing is virtually impossible. Um, a good example would be, look at a place like Chicago, right? Cook County. Now, Cook County is the second biggest county in America, right after LA. Um, and, but when you look at Cook County, you know that they have 400,000 cases, about 400,000 cases that come in every year. There is no way for the average voter to know the circumstances of all 400,000 of those cases, whether or not the prosecutor made the right call, what evidence they had. There's no record of that. And we don't keep those records. We're not good at transparency in the criminal justice system. So in some ways, like it's almost impossible to tell what your prosecutor is really doing and what the assistant prosecutors in the office are really doing every day. That being said, like you, prosecutors run on platforms, right? And traditionally they've run on platforms of being tough on crime. This is what prosecutors have done for 40 years. They've said, I will prosecute uh, people to the fullest extent of the law. I'll put people in prison. You know, this is, vote for me. The way to ensure that we see a different system is to demand that prosecutors are calling for something else. And we have seen that in the past, I would say five years, there's been a shift in the way we talk about prosecutors and what we ask from them. And we've seen more progressive prosecutors elect in places like Philadelphia, Boston, San Francisco, Chicago, St. Louis, Orlando. Um, you know, we've seen that there's a possible future um, in electing more progressive prosecutors and people who reflect similar, more similar values that to, to a criminal justice reform platform. So the best thing you can do is check out websites like Color of Change, the ACLU, and my um, 
umbrella organization, which is called the Justice Collaborative, and look up what you should be asking for your prose- from your prosecutor. What what does a good, a, a decent prosecutor do, right? And what do you want from them? And then, you know, they're responsive to the public. And so if they understand that people are unsatisfied with a system that throws millions of people in prison every year, they and they want to be reelected, they're going to have to shift their priorities, right? And so that's that's the most important thing to do. I'll just say one more thing, which is that in that piece, what I was really are trying to get at was that there's also a very, um, a very strong trend of prosecutors who aren't very progressive claiming they're progressive. And that's also sort of a new thing, right? You see it left and right where people are like, I started a department to check. And, you know, and then when you look into it, there's not a lot of there there. And you, it's a lot of people doing the same. I mean, this is sort of happening in Atlanta right now in my jurisdiction, like a, like a prosecutor has been here for many years doing the same thing he's basically always done and calling it different. And so that's when I think it gets complicated because you want to be able to trust that what they tell you they believe in, they believe in, but they're politicians too, right? And we all know that you can't trust everything that comes out of a politician's mouth just because they're saying it. So it's, it is definitely like a, a tough thing to evaluate, but luckily there are a lot of resources out there to help people kind of make these decisions. Yeah. And like, as you were mentioning the whole tough on crime thing. So in a previous focus on the state interview, I interviewed my uh, state Senator, uh, Jeff Jackson, and he's been pushing for some sort of criminal justice reform within the state, within the state legislature, which is difficult because we have, I do think the GOP actually has a super majority here in North Carolina. Um, and he, like his, some of the things he's tried to get past is something as simple as um, people on probation being able to apply for a driver's license because part of certain convictions, they drop the driver's license gets revoked. Um, and that's been shot down as too soft on crime. So when I had a discussion with him, I had mentioned uh, the history of Michael Dukakis, the Democrat presidential candidate from 1988 and the story of Willie Horton. And uh, Jeff Jackson said that's actually become a kill, a political kill switch, right? And that still holds sway in 2020 within elections about this idea that you can be too soft on crime will immediately lead to a similar story as Willie Horton. So can you yeah. explain the semantics of the Dukakis-Horton story? And has that narrative been overblown? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I was like one years old when the Dukakis thing happened. Um, and so I think it's shaped so much more of my kind of like experience, like in elections than I even realized. I mean, I obviously don't remember it. Right. But it's, it is um, a fairly. Like I was three, it, anything past Sesame street. I don't remember, yeah, but yeah. it's so relevant I, even I, today. Yeah, I know it's very relevant. I mean, the, the story is that Dukakis I, and this is what I remember. So I know I have the broad strokes, right. But I like my understanding is that Dukakis is doing really well in this race in 1988, right? Like it looked like he had a fair chance of winning. And one of the things, and I think had a major influence was this Willie Horton ad. He had been, I think, governor of Massachusetts and he had approved a furlough program, which meant that people who were serving time um, in prison could, could get out for work release and, and, for a few days at a time and had to return. And um, this the specifics of the furlough program, I'm not totally sure about, but Willie Horton got out and committed a horrible crime. And then this really racist ad runs where Willie Horton is this like hulking black guy who hurt a like white girl and the racial dynamics are horrible. And what it basically said to people was like, we can't trust you to keep us safe. I, I think it's simplistic to imply that that alone shaped like, the way we talked about criminal justice for for 20 years, but certainly had a major influence, right? And it told, it taught the GOP that this was a winning issue even more than they already knew it was. And then I think it also, you know, this is at, this is like in the midst of the war on drugs, right? Like this is in the midst of like the increase in mandatory minimums. Like a lot's already happening in criminal justice at this point. And so this is like putting it over the top. I think a couple of things to keep in mind, like politicians have been using tough on crime ads in like not just like presidential elections right but as we were talking about for in da races 
in ju- in judicial races, which is really, really disturbing the way that we use cap on crime, have historically used cap on crime in judicial races, just in, in every sort of elect- electoral space, like, We've said to elected officials, okay, you you did something that allowed someone to have access to a world where they could do something wrong. And therefore, like, we want to punish you for that. Um, and we don't want you to be reelected. But I think we're starting to think, thank God, about this in a slightly different way. At least, at least many people are. And, and it's important because the reality is that if you set it up so that politicians and elected officials, particularly elected officials in the criminal justice system, can never risk ever anybody doing something wrong or their political future is over. You know, you really are setting up the public for failure because, you know, like you see this all the time, right? There will be bail reform in a place like most recently in New York. Before this, it meant poor people, if they couldn't pay their 50, 100, $500 bail, just stuck in jail. I mean, that's crazy, right? Like to just be stuck in jail because you're poor. That's the only reason. Now you would see more people get out. Now, if 10,000 people get out, right, and one person does something really bad, it doesn't mean it's okay to commit a violent crime. But what it does mean is that nobody is ever going to talk about those other 9,999 people who went home to their families, you know, the moms and the parents who got to parent again, people who got to go back to their jobs, people who ended up being innocent because, you know, bail is a, is a pre-conviction um, um, tool. And so you never are going to hear about the people who were fine, right? We're okay. And that's the vast, 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 vast majority of people. You only ever hear about the terrible stories. And Willie Horton kind of normalized that in a way, the Willie Horton ad kind of normalized that in this way that's like, Okay, well, if you're an elected official now and you want to get reelected, you're not going to let that guy out. You're not going to let anybody out. (laughs) Why would you? The risk is too high. And now I think we're starting to see there's also another side of this, which is that it's terrible to put people in prison for excessively long times because you want to make sure you get (laughs) reelected. That's there's nothing ethical about that. Right. And so I think after 30 years of the Willie Corton approach kind of controlling how we look at criminal justice, I think we're slightly starting to move away from that. Yeah. Um, oh, I had a whole thought and it just ex- escaped me. I know that feeling, girl. <laughs> it's like every day of my life. <laughs> All right. Well, we could just move on to the next question because I totally just lost my thought. But if it comes back, you can say we'll fold it. So let's move into what's currently happening and how all this connects to the protest the frustrations that are reaching a fever pitch. So it does feel like in the past week that the social narrative has shifted and abolishing or at least defunding the police has become a much more prominent discussion point. And as an area that you've done a lot of work in, uh, for people that are new to this theory, what does defunding the police actually mean? And what Mm -hmm. makes this a good approach? And how can everyday citizens everyday citizens push towards this goal? Yeah, so I think what we talk about when we talk about defunding the police, so let's start with how we understand state and local budgets. Like the federal budget's a different thing, so let's just take that off the table. But most of policing and most of prosecution um, is funded by the state and localities, right? Most of the people, I think it's 84% of people who are in prison right now, like are there are in a state system or a local system. They're not there in the federal system. And when you think about these budgets, like it's a fixed pie, right? Like there's only so much money. They can't print money. They can't invent money. The Your local, I mean, I'm in Atlanta. Our local city has a budget. That's as far as it goes. There's no exceeding that. There's nothing you can do, right? And in cities and, and states across the country, but let's just focus on cities or counties right now. Like we're spending in many places 50, 60 percent of our budget on 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 policing. I mean, like the really like like 30 to 60 percent is not a surprising number to see um, of what we're spending on our budget. That's that's, you know, that's the budget that pays for education, a lot of education. That's the budget that pays for your parks and rec, your social services, your garbage pickup. 
like city salaries city like this infrastructure is a- yeah you know yeah. And, a, and a lot of the south doesn't actually have social services right you know right. you can't get health care you can't get food stamps like all these things that allow people to you right. know right you know, you're when you live in a state like North Carolina, when you live in a state like Georgia, like it's really hard for people to get the tools they need to survive. Minimum wage is too low. Like, you know, you can't, like you said, it's hard to access like food stamps. It's hard to access social services. It's absolutely like you, there's no health, there's no like meaningful universal health care in a lot of these places. Or and, even like an after school program for low income kids or like summer camp programs. Like in Charlotte, summer camp is really expensive and there's not a lot of programs that subsidize the cost of summer camp. Yeah. Um, And that's something that would be in the book. Or paid family leave or, you know, like I'm having a kid in three months. If my office doesn't give me maternity leave, the state isn't going to help me make sure that I can be paid for time off. Right. And so and these are places that they cut the budget nonstop for all the things we just said. Healthcare, budget cuts, education, budget cuts, parks and rec, budget cuts. I mean, like you see the actual effects of what happens um, in times of budget cuts. And I think particularly right now in pandemic times, right, because states, people are millions and millions of people are unemployed. They're not, you know, bringing in the income that helps pay the taxes in the state. And when they're not bringing in income to help pay the taxes, like the state doesn't make as much money and they have to cut the budget. But they barely ever cut the budget for policing. <laughs> they barely ever cut the criminal justice system budget. Um, and when we talk about defunding the police, we talk about reducing the amount of money we invest in a system that is causing so much harm and and resulting in so much tragedy, especially in black and brown neighborhoods. Reducing the amount of resources we're giving the system and figuring out how else we wanna spend those resources. If you take five, 10, 15% of the policing budget and you spend it on schools or you spend it on after school programs, like you said, or you provide people health care or you, you know, spend it on jobs, right? You'll see the need for that policing money to go down anyway, because we know that when you provide people the tools they need to live a dignified life, when you allow people an opportunity to feed their families, work a meaningful job, um, you know, take care of themselves, you, crime goes down, right? I think that the two other things I'd mention are this. One is that crime has been going down in this country for like, like years, like decades, right? I think crime has been going down for about, on and off for about like 15 years now, pretty, pretty consistently. And it's lower now than it's been in like 50 years. So but if you ask people if crime's up or down, almost everybody thinks it's gone up. It's just the nature of the news media that harps on anything bad that happens, which makes you think someone's going to come and break into your house at any second. It's the nature of, um, you know, the way that we talk about crime. And when you think about policing budgets, like we've seen crime go down, but we've seen policing budgets go up. And that doesn't really make much sense. We don't need, you know, they used to say that we need it. I don't think we needed it back then either, but we certainly- And are cops even really solving cases? I think like the, I don't know what the technical term is for it, but like the percentage of cases that are actually being solved. Yeah, that was low. the next, actually, you read my mind. I love it. That was the next thing I was going to say, which is that the other thing that's crazy is that cops aren't doing a very good job at their jobs. That, now look, that could mean a lot of different things. I don't want to say, I'm not saying every cop is like shirking on the job. What I'm saying is that they either don't have the tools that they need or the ability to focus on what actually matters to get, you know, to do their job well. And I think it's also a reflection of the way that they've, that the American society has lost trust in the cop. So if you're in a city like, um, I was just talking to someone from Baltimore earlier this week. In a city like Baltimore, which has 300 homicides a year and has had 300 homicides a year about every year for the past like four or five years alone, cops solve about a quarter of those murders, 25%, right? That means 75% of people who are murdered, we don't even know who did it. Those people are still walking the streets, apparently, right? Um, They solve about like 40% of reported property crimes. They solve a very low number of rapes. And so 
when you when you think about what you're paying the cops to do, they're not actually doing it that well. And part of the reason they're not doing it that well is because we are paying them to basically run over protesters on the street. We're paying them to like stop and frisk people for drugs, right? We're not actually prioritizing um, the right stuff to make sure that the people that we're giving 60% of our money to are doing, are getting it done. If you were giving 60% of your paycheck to someone who did their job 20% of the time, like I tell you, you are not, you need to get it together, <laughs> right? I tell you, that's not a good use of your money. And we know that cops are just, the policing infrastructure, and it could be, and it's the variables range of the reasons behind this, but it's not doing what we want it to do. We want, if we're going to have a policing infrastructure, we want them to solve murders. We want them to solve rapes. We want them to solve serious violent crimes. We don't want them to put a whole bunch of people in prison for low level drug offenses and solve a quarter of murders. That doesn't make any sense. I just did a video on how outrage is a profitable social currency. And part of that is because in the age of social media, a lot of us are getting our news from headlines. We're not even clicking on the story. We're getting hit. And so now a lot of journalistic outputs are focusing on headline packaging. So the mm -hmm. article might actually give more information that changes the narrative, but the headline is meant to not only grab your attention, but to evoke an emotional reaction. And so mm -hmm. particular to this tough on crime narrative and the necessity of tough on crime because, oh, this one person might come into your house and kill you, is that oftentimes these, these stories of somebody, is, is the correct term recidivized? for someone who came out of jail, right? somebody who might be recidivized of uh, committing another felony, but no one's gonna read the story to actually read the particulars of what even made that possible. So like recently there was like a woman who forgave her mother's killer, hired him, and then apparently he killed her. But you know, all you hear, um, like, and it's all, it was like all over the, you know, my timeline, you know, well, Facebook yeah. is a little bit different from Twitter, but it was all over Facebook, right? Yeah. The regular yeah. folk. And so right. <laughs> I was like, you know, I actually read the article. And I'm like, oh, well, there were, there are all these other things that are happening that made that possible. Yeah. Right. Past the idea that this man was ever released. Like, right. you know, there right. was no system in place to recidivize him, right? right. There were no structures. He wasn't in therapy. There weren't all these, all these other things that would, for someone who's been incarcerated for 15 years, that they would need right. to go to go through in order to become, you know, right. a regular citizen again. And he right. was just kind of thrust back into to society. And then there was something else happening that caused him to break, right? But most people mm -hmm. aren't going to read that article. They're just going to see the headline and then that carries the narrative. And then we also have this whole cop agenda, right? Through mm -hmm. popular media with the, not just the mm -hmm. news, but the TV and the movies that we consume that suggest necessity of tough on crime that's really fueling this idea that we actually have a higher crime rate than we do. Yeah, yeah, was... I think that's, that's, no, that's a really great point. And look, like, it's, it's so, so often it's more complicated than the headline would have you believe, right? So often, like, the headline kind of leaves out the system's complicity or perpetuation of this, of the, of the, of someone's bad behavior. So like you said, like, we don't build prisons to rehabilitate people. We build them, you know, we convict people of crimes. We tell them they've, they're, they've done something bad. They're bad people. They have to go to prison. And then in prison, we treat them and expose them to, you know, no meaningful services and a hell, I mean, it, prisons are hell, right? And then we expect them to come out and be, have everything be fixed, which is just not how anybody works. It's not how people work. It's not how animals work. I mean, we know enough about behavioral science to know this is a predictable reaction, a predictable result of, of the system we set up. But I also just want to point out that like, there's another thing here, which is that it's tempting, I think, for people who work in criminal justice change in particular to imagine that if we gave everybody everything they needed, they would never do anything bad again, right? And the truth is that people are complicated. Like the United States has almost 400 million people in it. And it would be silly to imagine, to tell ourselves that, okay, we could set up the perfect government system and nothing bad would ever happen again, right? We can't make policy based on the worst case scenario. And that means that like we, we live in a world with a little bit of risk, right? Um, you know, what I always say to people is, 
there are places with very little civilian on civilian violence, right? And those places um, either are providing people with a ton of resources that they need to be, you know, I'm thinking of places like Iceland and, but then the opposite of that is like a place like North Korea, like you could live in North Korea and there's no one's going to like steal from your house because the punishment for that is so drastic <laughs> that they are not. And do you want to live in North Korea? No, you don't, because you want to be you're always going to be balancing the risk of living in a healthy, free society and the potential that something could go wrong. And we can't expect the system to ensure for people that they were, are totally safe. They're never going to be totally safe. That's imaginary. I mean, it's totally imaginary. So, you know, I do this work every day. Someone could break in my house and kill me tonight. It's almost impossible that that's going to happen because that very, very, very rarely happens. But if you're there's it's not a zero percent chance because you can't get to a zero percent chance. Right. Um, and to you know, your point, you're... like an over police state, it's like it's crime really not happening in an over police state or is exactly. it just not being reported? Because you'd have to imagine that intimate partner violence is still really high. Things exactly. like rape are still occurring. Exactly. Child abuse, like abuse is still occurring on some wavelength. Right. So it's not that you might you might not do things to people outside of your community. Oh. Right. Yes. But that doesn't right. actually cure violence. No, I think that's a great point. And I think, you know, one of the things, so to my point about the low clearance rate, how few crimes are actually solved, a very few number of crimes are even reported. We don't, like, not every time that someone gets their car broken into, are they calling the cops? Not every time. I know time they're that, useless. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, mean, I wouldn't, like, a knock on wood, nobody come and break into my car, please. But, like, it's, like, my point is just, like, I mean, like, I remember growing up that, like, someone in our neighborhood, when I, when I was growing up in Atlanta, my mom's car got broken into, like, repeated. That's, like, status Atlanta. Like, you move to Atlanta, you know you're getting robbed. <laughs> that would be rude, but, like, everybody knows. The cops could have come, they could have taken the report and, like, whatever, but we didn't do that. It just wasn't... We, you didn't think that there was going to be any result. First of all, I mean, this is like when I was a kid before I even had a theory of criminal justice change. Like there wasn't going to be any result. And if you know that the system is so harsh, right, you're less likely to hold people accountable for wrongdoing through this system, I think. You know, and to your point about domestic violence, like this is something we see all the time. Like if you're in an abusive relationship, there are very few avenues for you. And people say, call the cops. Well, you're in a relationship with someone and you don't trust the cops. And if we're not creating a world in which we trust the people who are supposed to keep us safe, we're in trouble because they're not gonna even know what's happening. I mean. The estimate is like 30% of, of violent crime, I think it is, is reported. That's the estimate. I mean, it's very hard to know that. And even less of property crime. And think about drug crimes. Like, you know, what, 1% of drug crimes are ever, like, much less than that. We are, you catch your kid smoking weed in their room, you're not going to call the cops, right? Like, you, so, so much of the way that we deal with criminal, criminal, criminal activity anyway is, is inner community. It's not systemic. And so the fact that the system has been able to cause this much harm renders it even more important def to defund it when you realize that we're already handling a lot of this ourselves. What's the difference between the call for defunding the police versus the call to abolish the police? Yeah, I think um, it depends on how far people want to take it. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. I think the defunding conversation right now has focused mostly on, look how much money we're spending on cops. Do we need to be spending this much money? Are they doing their job? Let's spend less, right? It's pretty practical. It's pretty tangible. It's kind of like, look at the numbers. Like, here's, like, this is ridiculous how much money we're spending on people who are ineffective. I think the talk about abolishing police is a little bit bigger, a little bit more transformative and a little bit more bold. And when we talk about abolishing the police or abolishing prisons, we're not talking about tomorrow, sh you know, shutting them all down, ending the system overnight and calling it a day. What we're saying is that we want to spend government capital, and I mean that both political capital, economic capital, um, social capital, on creating a world that doesn't need this system. 
we don't have to live in a society where we see a ton of violent crime. We don't have to live in a society that allows for rampant domestic abuse. We can create a world where violence, where where what we consider to be crime, where abuse is virtually non-existent. That is possible. And it's only possible if we if we understand this system from the front end and we think of it as a system that creates the tools that we need and provides the tools that we need to live dignified, stable lives. This is going really re- way past the criminal justice system. It's about getting rid of a society that's so misogynistic, right? It's about getting rid of a society that's racist. It's about getting rid of a society that's classist. It's about really reshaping our values at a very basic level. At that, you know, when you think about that world, you can imagine a world where we don't have prisons. You can imagine a world where accountability is handled in different ways. And so people, you say abolish police and people are like, or abolish prison, people are like, <gasps> like what am I going to do? And I totally get that instinct. It, fe- it sounds like, Okay, yeah, sure. But what we're saying is that there is a world that we can that we should be working towards that renders these systems obsolete. And it's not just that these systems aren't working for us, right? But it's that these systems are tied into every other system. And if we don't provide the resources we need to to deal with those systems, we're never going to have what we need to deal with to deal with this one. And so you know, it's it reminds me of the way we talk about truth and reconciliation or other tools in which we are asking people to be accountable to the people around them versus just be accountable to the state. Yeah. And is even talking about whether we say we want to defund the police or abolish the police is is that enough? Like, is that the only system we should be looking at? And like, what other systems do we have to consider when we start talking about the militarization of the police, the racial disparity and how police deal with different communities? Yeah, I mean, Jules, I'm writing a whole book on this. So you and you are like, I'm very impressed with how (laughs) quickly you got to the thesis. But I think it is, um, it is, No, the short answer to your question is no. I mean, the criminal justice system is part of the problem. It's not the whole problem, right? It's just not. And we are using it as a Band-Aid, a Band-Aid that ends up causing its own enormous level of harm, but to not deal with the fact that in America right now, we do not provide people with the tools they need to live a stable, again, a stable, dignified life and to treat other people with stability and dignity. Um, These are not values of ours, right? Our values are money, our values are production, our values are work and like bootstraps and whatever. We don't focus on creating whole people and creating healthy people. And so I, you know, this is my life's work as criminal justice. I mean, I think I'll be doing this till I die. But other people are correct when they know that their life's work, too, is about, um, you know, the issues that they work on are also about the same thing. They're about creating a world where we're all um, live and live with the tools that we need to survive and not just survive, but thrive. But right? quality and, of life, right? Like even within the, the labor struggle or the economic struggle, right? Something that's often overlooked is people weren't, haven't since, you know, the passing of the 13th Amendment, haven't just been, well, black folks haven't just been fighting for the access to work, but we've been fighting for the access to quality, respectable right. work. Equal, right. right. To, I mean, to what we think of as, you know, people talk about like climbing the ladder, like, you, we are talking about generations of people who haven't seen a wage increase when you account for inflation in 50, 60 years, functionally. Like you used to be able to feed your family on one salary and send them to you know school and go to the beach once a year. And now people can't pay one bedroom rent. I mean, the, the world that we have created on basically every structural and social level is harming actively daily causing traumatizing black people, brown people, immigrants, poor people, people in rural areas. I mean, it it covers so many different, different places. And, and, And there are many sort of reasons for that. But ultimately, the point is, like, 
if tomorrow I snapped my fingers and criminal justice must fix, like we couldn't be like, oh, okay, there we are. Like we have solved America now, you know, because all of this is related to who we are kind of more fundamentally. And that's, that's what I'm writing about right now is, you know, what do we value? What do we value? Yeah. And so I want to take it back because I actually skipped over a question. Well, I skipped over two questions. But judges, you mentioned kind of when we were talking about the Dukakis Horton story about, Mm -hmm. you know, do people even, well, this wasn't the frame you were referencing it, but I'm thinking, do people even realize that judges are elected officials? And oftentimes now in the age of social media, we think about do we even think about judges one, but we might think about the court cases because, you know, we saw a tweet go viral about a court case at LDF or the lawyers committee under civil rights law, you know, uh, with like in North Carolina, the congressional map has been in the state courts, right. Or vo- various voter suppression laws, because that's been a hot topic in Wisconsin, in, well, battleground states. So Wisconsin and North Carolina. Um, but realizing that the people that are putting, bringing down these orders are elected officials as well um and our people i don't know that we as everyday people are really attuned to the judicial elections that happen in our county state because they're different and so it's hard to even because i've worked with the lawyers committee under civil rights law which is a mouthful to do (laughs) videos about like in north carolina i think in like the eastern district they were trying to um have thomas farr appointed Mm -hmm. to the federal courts right um, but even that to get to that point of someone being elected to federal courts, they've well in the past prior to Trump, they at least have been elected to a judgeship. Right. Uh, and even realizing that we have a hand in that, it's kind of hard to talk about because every state has a different, like the way they do judge elections in Louisiana is quite different from how we do yeah. them in North Carolina. So it's hard to really provide information that everyone can just go home with. But to get to the actual question in this current climate, what is the importance of judges when it comes to like the protesting and riots and really whichever way we decide to discuss police reform. Yeah, I love that you asked this question. I have to tell you, it like makes my day. Um, and judicial elections was sort of how I, I wouldn't say how I started getting in this work, that's not true, but it was sort of one of the first issues I started to really care about because when I went to law school, I was like, what? Like I had a professor, Professor Hansen, who was like, this is what's going on in the judicial elections. And I was like, this is insane. Nobody, I had no idea, right? So it's true. On the federal level, judges are appointed, um, which has its own issues, obviously. Like Trump is appointing judges to to federal co- courts across or the country. Or lawyers that have never arbitrated are getting appointed to federal judges. Yeah, I mean, Trump is like putting total amateur idiots who are horrible in charge of federal courts, right? So and we don't have a lot of policy that says you can remove someone once they've been appointed to these judges. You have none. I mean, they're, I mean, absent extreme, extreme circumstances, if you're appointed to a federal judge, you can stay there till you, you die. I mean, you could retire, but like it's, that's it. Right. So, um, on the, on the state and low, the state level, which like also includes the local level on this, like, it, like you said, it varies by state to state. So sometimes there are partisan elections where you're literally electing a Democrat judge or Republican. Sometimes it's nonpartisan. Sometimes someone's appointed and then um, and then the elect like the electorate goes to the to the ballot just to decide if they want that person to stay. Point being, judges really matter. They make decisions and in cases, it's not just juries. They make plenty of decisions in both criminal and civil cases, right? They decide stuff like, does this person get out on bail? Or they really shape, I mean, there was a famous controversy like 10 years ago when Sotomayor came on um, the bench because she had said that judges make policy and people were so outraged by that. They were like, no, judges are only supposed to call balls and strikes. They're not political figures. They're not, but she was right. Judges, the decisions they make, I mean, look at the Supreme Court, like those decisions they make, shape policy for generations, for generations. And so um, judicial elections are enormously important and they've actually been highly influenced over the past 30 years by the way we talk about tough on crime stuff, right? Um, Like judges have run on, it's a very, there's like, I could literally talk about this forever, so I'm not gonna like go too deep, but um, it's 
for various reasons, judges have run on tough on crime platforms. And so when you are expecting, to, like, let's say you get arrested, let's say you've been accused of something you didn't do, or you did do, who knows, like, let's say you've been accused of, um, of attempted murder, and you go to court, and you see a judge, and it's a judge that's up for election that year, are they gonna be, they're supposed to be fair, they're supposed to decide on the law, they're supposed to decide fairly between the prosecutor and the defense, are do you, are you going to get a fair shot? Because they need to be reelected. And what if they, I mean, this goes back to our earlier point. What if, you know, what if you get out and you do something terrible again? Or what if um, you're the subject of their next commercial, their anti, the commercial against them, right? It may, has made it extremely difficult <clears throat> for people who have ever served in a, a defense capacity to get on the bench too. And so what you see among, among, among judges is, is in drastically more former prosecutors on the bench than former defense attorneys. And that's a real problem. You want the bench to reflect um, the, the width of legal experience and people who really know what they're doing. You either want people to be totally independent so that they're making decisions based on what they think is best or you want them to be totally accountable. And what has kind of happened is the middle, which is theoretically they're accountable because there's an election, but nobody knows the judges they're voting for. I mean, I'm voting on Tuesday, right? I do this work and I'm texting my friend that works at the court, like, who's good? Like, I don't know, you know? It's like, who knows what their local judge does? I mean, because there's so little investment culturally in judge elections, it's often hard. You know, you don't get debates. They're not necessarily as accessible as maybe like right. my state senator who's running because he has to run every two right. years. So exactly. it's hard to really get, and then they're- Vote it. Like, it's not like, oh, did they support this thing? Let me see if they voted for this referendum or whatever. It's just not the same thing. And look, I don't know that you want judges. I don't know if you want judges debating because you want judges to make decisions based on what's in front of them. And and when you, when they get very ideological, it gets hard, right? Like if you have a judge who's like, I will never vote for like, a, a, I, I will always support big business, right? Well, a small business could go in front of them easily. And that now they've made this promise to the electorate and it's been compromised. What you want is a judge who says like, I'm going to assess the evidence that's in front of me. I'm going to assess the law as it is, as it, as it stands and make a determination, which, which shouldn't mean making the harshest determination. It doesn't mean you don't use your judgment, but it means that there's some sense of order in the, in the, in, in the idea of what a judge does. The last thing I'll say about this is that, again, judici the judicial system has no transparency. And so even if right now all of us were like, we're going to care about who our judge is, like, we're going to look it up. Most progressive judge wins. Who knows? Like, you can't just go online and be like, what did this judge do in court? Like, it doesn't work like that. Right. And it's very difficult. I mean, to your point about state senators or city councilmen or Congress people, like those people vote on bills. We at least know how they voted. It's still not enough transparency, but we at least can say, OK, you supported this. You didn't support this. You can't do that with judges. And so judicial elections have actually had a really harmful effect. I think, on the criminal justice system much more than people recognize. I'll also just mention that I think in places where, ju where judges, not on the federal level, again, not dealing with Trump, but on the state and local level, what we see is that places with judicial elections tend to have a much wider electorate than places where judges are appointed. Um, um, and I, I mean, I'm sure there's an entire social science behind that, and I'm not sure how consistent that finding is across states, but I found that really surprising. It's just, it, it's, it, it actually does not make it more democratic. It makes it more elite. I think particular to understanding who you're even going to vote for if judges are running is we don't, who knows how to read a court case? Like who knows how to right. get through a document? And a lot of times, you know, I was listening to, because, well, Sherilyn Eiffel, but I was listening to one of her podcast episodes and she was talking about how one thing that she feels really remiss about is what, uh, particular to the Supreme Court, but I think this can kind of be parsed out on all levels that we have judges in this country. A lot, the judges don't often reflect the people. We don't right. have people that, and she was, she quoted Sotomayor as well, who had discussed about, you know, because there's not a lot of defense attorneys who make it into these judgeships, who understand what it means to defend someone and where the world that the defense, the people, the person who's the defendant is coming from, 
Um, and they're often prosecutorial. That's such a complicated word for me. Oh, <laughs> but, yeah, I know you said it perfectly. <laughs> but that perfectly. they don't often relate to the people. And so we, as you were saying, some of the harm that's been done, particularly to criminal justice reform is, you know, our, we're getting a lot more prosecutors, we're getting a lot more, you know, older white men. And do they really relate to the, the issues that put somebody in their court in the first place? Yeah, so that's a huge issue. And that's actually true for the whole parts of the system, sort of like you said. I mean, most prosecutors, for example, are white males, most elected prosecutors, right? I mean, the dra- the vast, vast majority. I think probably right now, I mean, I probably know of, I'd estimate maybe there are like 10, 15 elected black women prosecutors, maybe nationwide, black. you know, and I think this is reflected in, in all of the sort of elements of the system, prosecutors, judges, et cetera. And the, the, a famous story about this, in 2017, the Louisiana Supreme Court had this ruling that's become extremely famous in criminal defense circles and criminal justice reform circles because uh, a guy was arrested and he um, was being interrogated. And when he was being interrogated, he said to detectives, just give me my lawyer dog. He said, give me a lawyer dog. And they decided that he was not being clear and his ask for a lawyer because he ended it with dog. And so he could have been asking for a lawyer dog, like a dog that's a lawyer. And so they didn't count that as um, a violation of his of his request for counsel um, and a violation of his constitutional rights. It's outrageous, obviously, to imagine that this man wasn't asking for a lawyer. He was very clearly asking for a lawyer. And I would bet you the cops knew that, right? Like, I, my guess is that the cops, the cops didn't think he was asking for a dog. Cops knew he was asking for a lawyer. I mean, I... What's a lawyer you know, or a dog? Like, what's a, what's a dog? It's, not a thing. it's just not a thing. But if you're on the Louisiana Supreme Court... You don't, you are like a, you know, you don't look or talk like most of the people who are going through the system. And you are, therefore, I would argue, infringing on people's constitutional rights because you don't have any cultural context or social context for people's lives. Um, And that means, I mean, the lawyer dog story is so crazy, but what's what I think it's reflected in even the stories about people being shot by the police, right? There are serious disparities between how the system sees people, how it understands people, and who fills the system, and who's going through the system. When you have a system that's processing and putting away Black, Brown, and poor people, but the lawyers and the judges and the people in the system are um, rarely Black, Brown, and poor, you face a cultural divide that really only ends up hurting defendants. Yeah, but... Man, that's really, really relevant to like so many things. But um, to take it back a little bit, we've talked a lot about prosecutors across every realm that we've covered. Just even the idea of like who prosecutors are has come up Um, and connected to our presidential election because Joe Biden has committed to picking a woman. Um, I think some may believe that at least with a woman or a Democrat woman that we might get a slightly more progressive candidate and that's being very, very gracious. But on his short list, five of the women he is looking at are prosecutors. And again, with my state senator, Jeff Jackson, I didn't even ask him what kind of law he practices, but he does have a law degree from Emory. And there's just a prevalence overall of lawyers as elected officials and particularly of prosecutors as elected officials on every level of government. So. My question for you is, is there a question we should be asking or even thinking about or thinking through about the prevalence of prosecutors in our political playing field? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good point. Like, I think it I think that traditionally becoming a prosecutor has been seen as a um, as a entry into politics. And that was true for years. I mean, we have former presidents. Tons of judges, like we said earlier, tons of elected officials are former prosecutors. And what concerns me about that is not just the over representation of prosecutors, but the under representation of other people in the system. For example, criminal defense lawyers. Some of those candidates worry me more than others is one thing worth pointing out. I think on Minneapolis, um, what we're seeing right now with an officer who committed 
pretty horrifying police brutality under Amy Klobuchar's tenure and then was not held accountable. I mean, that obviously holds that obviously I find really um, concerning. I also think that doesn't have to be dispositive about what a person is capable of bringing to the table if we see that they really have changed in the way that they think about the system. This has been a system that has brutalized people for 30 years. I think it's important to hold people accountable for the decisions they've made. Um, I think it's important to recognize that some people get into this field because they think they can make change from the inside out. Whether or not that's totally true, whether or not you can make really revolutionary criminal justice change as a prosecutor, I think has yet to be seen, but certainly you can, you, it's harm reduction, right? Having good, a better prosecutor in office um, is harm reduction. And so like, I, I don't think that just serving in this role automatically disqualifies you from, from holding higher office. What I do think is that, again, and I sort of started by saying this, it's an extremely opaque system. It's, it's really hard for people to access the information to know exactly what's happening at every given time. Even people who work in this field, right, are still kind of often flying blind when it comes to data or decision making. Um, and, and I think that people who have worked in this field have an obligation to speak out um, against mass incarceration, to speak out against prosecutorial abuse, to speak out against police violence, and to really think about how to endorse, um, you know, a different system, not because they've necessarily caused the same level of harm as the worst, worst, worst people, but because working in the system legitimizes it. And what we need is to rethink about whether or not that legitimacy should exist today in 2020. The last thing I'll say about this is that one of the reasons that police and prosecutors have traditionally been, um, been, you know, police chiefs and prosecutors have ended up running for office and they are overrepresented is because in this country, like criminal justice culture reigns supreme, right? It's the cop shows, police worship, and then blue th the thin blue line and the entire narrative around criminal justice has been that these are the public safety heroes keeping us from a daily life of chaos and destruction. I think we're seeing more and more that that's not true. And that it's not so much a question of, is each of these people in the system terrible? But what is the purpose of the system overall? And is this the kind of culture that we want to value fundamentally? So, um, you know, the record to, to conclude, I mean, I would say that the, the candidates' records matters the most to me, the, the various vice presidential candidates. And I wish that we lived in a world where we saw as many civil rights lawyers or defense lawyers up for these positions um, as prosecutors. But if prosecutors, former prosecutors are going to ascend to higher office, they need to be talking about these issues, which many of them, which some of them are at least. All right, so, oh man, you just made so many great points, but that is all of my questions. Thank you for answering all my questions. I mean, I really hope, well, it's not that I hope, but I know everyone who watches this will absolutely be walking away with new knowledge. And I really, really, really appreciate you giving us your time to provide so much insight for my audience. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. We're going to close out here.